And the Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore criest thou unto me? Speak unto the children of Israel that they go forward. But lift thou up thy rod and stretch out thine hand over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. And I, behold, I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians. They shall follow them. And I will get me honor upon Pharaoh and upon all his host, upon his chariots and upon his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gotten me honor upon Pharaoh, upon his chariots and upon his horsemen. Amen. I feel led to back up in reading. Let's go over to verse... 10. And when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them, and they were sore afraid. And the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. And they said unto Moses, Because thou there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou dealt thus with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? Is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians. For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which He will show to you today for the Egyptians whom you have seen today ye shall see them again no more forever. The Lord shall fight for you, and ye shall hold your peace. And the Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore criest thou unto me? Speak unto the children of Israel, that they go forward. Father, I come before you right now, and I thank you for your mighty word. I thank you for your mighty presence. We pray, Father, we give you glory and honor in everything we do tonight. In Jesus' name, amen, you may be seated. The people of God, as we showed you this morning, have a direct command from God, a divine order from God, to change the direction that they were going. They were going a clear shot up to the promised land, and God tells them to turn. Instead of heading east, to the promised land. He tells them to go a different direction, the western side of the Red Sea. We talked about it this morning, how it takes great faith to trust God when His commands and His orders go contrary to our human reasoning, our human knowledge. And we're very tempted as a people. We're not glorified yet. So as a people, we're very tempted to give in to human reasoning, intellect, really basically going back to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and relying upon uh, satanic wisdom or human wisdom instead of the wisdom of God Almighty. But you will remember what happens when you take of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you lose the glory and you lose the power in your life. Amen? And what happens is fear grips you. Fear gripped Adam when he sinned against God because he wasn't where he needed to be in God. So when you and I are not where we need to be in God, we're relying on our own abilities, our own mind, our own human wisdom. We lose the glory of God, the power of God in our life. And we start walking in fear. And so we see they have obeyed the Lord to a point, but now they start letting fear get a hold of them which tells me they're starting to rely upon their own abilities, their own intellect of what they see naturally. Because fear's got a hold of them. You know, what happens to you is you go into fear, you go into hiding, you lose the power of God in your life, you lose the glory of God in your life. And and so it's a paralyzing thing that can get a hold of all of us. Amen. So we have to be very careful that we don't give ourselves to our flesh. 
that old wisdom that we used to walk in, worldly wisdom, you know. Uh, we, we can identify very quickly if we are because the glory's not there, the power's not there, and we're walking in fear. The Bible talks about people who run when nobody's chasing them. You know, there's, there's no enemy chasing them, but they're running because they're afraid. They live in paranoia. So we've got to stop eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We've got to stop relying upon our own ability, what we're thinking. And we must begin to walk by the Word of the Lord and by His Spirit, by the glory that's living inside of us. Amen? I'm preaching to people tonight that want to be victorious. I believe you want to be victorious. I don't believe you want to walk in fear. I don't want to, I don't believe you want to hide in the garden. I don't believe you want to be defeated. I don't believe you want to be people who've been sucked into death. I don't believe you want to be a people who've lost the power and the glory of God in your life. I believe I'm preaching to some people tonight that want to be victorious. And you're, you're just looking for answers. And I'm speaking by the Holy Ghost. You're just looking for some answers. And you're coming here to church and you're saying, Pastor, tell us. From the Word of God, give us the answer to the situations that we're in right now. Give me a word that I can go by because what I'm in right now, the battle I'm in right now is I need a word from God. I can't rely upon my own thinking. I can't, I can't trust my abilities. I can't give myself to my flesh. It's, it's a big battle, Pastor. And in some, I hear the Holy Ghost say right now to me, there's somebody, there's a family in this church right now, I don't even know that you're in a battle as far as from you. You haven't come and you haven't talked to me and you haven't said, Pastor, we're having pro problems here and we're having problems there. But I'm telling you by the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost knows where you are. And the best thing you can do right now is to get up and to worship God and to glorify God and start giving, stop giving yourself to worry and to fear and to doubt and stop hiding. Get the glory back. Get the power of God back get the direction you need back in your life make the necessary adjustments and the necessary changes in your life to begin to walk victorious again because I'm going to tell you something you don't have to stay defeated you don't have to stay a people that's powerless you don't have to stay a people that's lost the glory of God you don't have to stay in the trap where you're relying upon your own intellect amen because God wants you to live. He doesn't want you to die. He wants you to walk in victory. He wants you to walk in faith. He wants you to have, He wants you to rule in life. But you have to make up your mind to walk in faith and trust God's word. Trust God's wisdom. Live by God's ways. And oftentimes it's going to go contrary to what you think in your own mind. Whenever God began to direct them the way He was directing them, they didn't understand what He was doing. The Bible says Moses knew the ways of God. One, one passage, Moses knew the ways of God, the children, the acts of God. But what that meant was that, that Moses understood God's ways and he revealed the ways of God to the people and they acted it out. There's, always, there's people who want to know the acts of God. But I want to know God's ways. And oftentimes God's ways go contrary to our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. His ways are higher than our ways. And I promise you today, you are defeated tonight if you're leaning upon your own understanding. I want to know God's ways. Amen. I want to preach it to you so you'll know the ways of God so we can live victorious as a people. Amen. And so, God led them this way. They couldn't figure it out. God gave a, demand, a direct demand or command and order to go a certain direction that was completely the wrong direction from where they were going toward Canaan. Didn't make sense to them whatsoever. But Moses, by faith, obeyed God despite what the people might think about him. 
And the Bible says the people did it. They went forward, the Bible says, and this, and the Bible says, and they did so, verse 4, what God told them to do. And they walked and they walked and it was going the wrong direction in their mind. And they came to the edge of the Red Sea. One mountain on either side. And all of a sudden, with the Red Sea in front of them and two mountains, one on either side, they look up behind them and here comes the enemy. From the enemy's perspective and from their perspective, they're setting targets to be destroyed. But from God's perspective, God was saying it's not for your destruction. It's not for your defeat. It's for your deliverance. And when you get to a place in your life, and you will, if you walk with God very long, you will get to a place in your life where it will look like it's all over. This is the end. It doesn't seem possible that a victory will come out of it. With you it's impossible, but not with God. All things are possible. <clears throat> so when you and I think, and I, I've been there a few times in my own self. I try not to give in to my emotions. But sometimes I've been there and I say, I don't know if it's, I don't know, I don't know. It just seemed like it's, but I've seen God over and over and over and over step in to situations that I thought it was the end. And I thought it was over and it wasn't. And God says, no, I just brought you to this place. Not for you to be destroyed, but for the enemy to be destroyed. I brought you to this place to bring victory into your life. So that when your past tries to come back and recapture you, when your past tries to come and take you back into bondage, God said, I brought you to this place so I can deal with it on a final way. So I can kill it. I can slay it. And this morning, the anointing of the Holy Ghost was upon me to preach to the church to tell them, sometimes you got to leave your hands off of situations because all you're doing is prolonging the problem in your life. But if you'll begin to stop trusting in your own mind and your own ability and think you know the answer and trust in your intellect, if you'll begin to say yes to God and say no to your own thinking, even when it goes contrary to what you want, it goes contrary to your emotions. They say, not my will, but your will be done. God will step in and He will defeat that problem once and for all. God wanted to defeat Pharaoh once and for all so he wouldn't keep popping his head up. The problem we have is that we try to make it happen on our own. And we think, well, this is what looks best to us. We, we are people who are governed by logic, reason, and judgment. Whatever seems reasonable, whatever seems logical, then we make a judgment on it like that. No, we are not a people based on logic, reason, and judgment. We're a people who walk by faith in the Word of God. And sometimes God says, leave it alone. Take your hands off of it because I'm going to lead you in a place contrary to what you think. But I'm going to deal with it. I'm going to deal with that problem in your life in a final way so it will never happen to you again. That trouble will never come to you again. Hallelujah. Give God worship in the house. And I'd rather go through a temporary time in my life of, of uncomfort. I would rather go through a period in my life where it doesn't make sense. If God can come in my life and deal with my problem in a final way. So it'll never come up again. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Give God praise. <coughs> there is a mystery in God. And that mystery in God is this. Some people say, well, why does God allow things to continue? Like He does. He went to the cross. He died. He was buried. He rose again the third day. He defeated principalities and powers. He defeated the devil. Then why does He allow things to continue as they are? Because He wants to bring His universe into a place where when the devil is finally forever defeated, that He will never be able to raise up His head again. That He'll not be able to ever tempt anybody ever again. Do you understand? It is a mystery in God how He allows things to continue for a long period of time. And it doesn't make sense. 
But God is saying, I've got to deal with it in a final way. I've got to deal with sin in a final way. I've got to deal with Satan in a final way. So that he will never in eternity ever raise his head up again. So when it looks like the people of God are going to be set up for destruction, God is simply doing this, positioning them for deliverance. And it will be a final deliverance. God's going to cut Pharaoh off. And he's never going to be a problem for them ever again. Hallelujah. <clears throat> when you deal with your children, when you deal with situations in your life, when you deal with your own life, you have to understand there's something that's beyond this lifetime. You have to make decisions that are based on eternal principles. And sometimes they're hard. You understand? How many know it's, it's not easy sometimes to chastise your children? It's not easy to correct your children, is it? Why do you do it? Because you want them to be in heaven. You're not trying to make them happy with everything in this life. You're trying to say, I'm preparing you for the other side. And I might not ever see you on this side. But if I see you on that side, that's all that matters to me. Sometimes God is going to call you to very difficult situations and decisions in your life. And those decisions are simply this. I want to make it and I want everybody I know to make it to the other side. And sometimes that's hard. That's hard. It's hard to live that way. But I'm going to live that way. Hallelujah. Because eternity is for real for me. Heaven is real to me. Hell is real to me. So when you start going through things, you've got to see things from the perspective of eternity. And understand God's going to request of you certain things that doesn't make a lot of sense. But He knows what's best. He knows how to get the devil off of you. He knows how to get the flesh. He knows how to get the world out of you. In the name of Jesus. And you've already tried it your way. The Holy Ghost has spoken directly into some of your lives about how to handle certain situations. And you didn't do it. And you're having major, major problems right now. Major problems. And no, you haven't come and talked to me. But I know it in the Spirit. Because you're not listening to God when God talks to you. If you and I would start listening to God when God talks to us, God could defeat that problem in our lives forever. Once and for all. But we want to keep on putting our hands on it. We want control of it. No, no, no. You let God take control of it. You trust God. Hallelujah. And at some point, you need to start believing that there's somebody in your life that cares about you. That number one, God cares about you. Number two, your pastor cares about you. And sometimes God is going to speak to your pastor and tell you to do certain things. It's not going to be easy for you to follow. They're not going to be easy. But if you'll listen, if you'll do what God says, you will end up victorious. But as long as you keep trying to do it your way, you're going to fall into one failure after another failure after another failure. And I know your pride doesn't like it, but you might as well just say, Yes, Lord! This wasn't meant for your destruction. What you're in. What I'm in wasn't meant for my destruction. It was meant for my deliverance. Hallelujah. God help me to preach. i tell you what I love. I love people who come into church and they've been in the church for a little while. Man, they're fired up, you know. And they want to point a finger at everybody in the church about what they're doing wrong. And they haven't been in the church very long and all of a sudden they get real quiet. What happened to you? Don't come in here like that. Get up out of your death. Get up out of your self-pity. Get up out of that situation and start moving with God. Hallelujah. Would you give the Lord a hand clap of praise? I do believe God wants to give you an answer and I believe that you have come for an answer. But when He gives you the answer, will you do something with it? Will I do something with it? You have to trust God. So at first the people did good. They looked up, they saw the enemy coming. They lifted their voice in prayer unto God. Then they started blaming Moses. And then they started saying, well, we wish we were back in Egypt. 
serving the Egyptians. And just what we predicted has come to pass. They started talking about, you know, we knew this was going to happen. Our predictions are coming to pass. They said in verse 12, after they blamed Moses, by the way, as I said, God was the one that led them there. But they blamed Moses for it. And in verse 12, is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians, for it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. You see, they get to a place, well, we told you so. <clears throat> Moses, we told you. We tried to tell you. You know? Our predictions are coming to pass. See, they're kind of gloating pridefully. They don't have a clue. God is setting the devil up. He's setting Pharaoh up for destruction. And they're talking about how they predicted way back when they were in Egypt that bad things were coming. Say again, relying upon their own human intellect. Come on, church. If we're not careful, we get this. Yeah, it was just everything, everything's so bad. Everything, yeah, yeah. Just dropping and complaining about everything and talking about it. I knew, I just, I just knew it. I told you, hun, I just knew it. Why don't we trust God? Why don't we walk with God in unusual places and, and walk with Him by faith? Why don't we believe God for a miracle to come and help us in any situation? Instead of talking about, well, I predicted this. God brought them there. God brought them out. He's fixing to wipe the enemy completely out so he'll never rise his head up again. You see where intellect gets you? Human intellect. then what I see is interesting. I'm going to let you catch up with me. Moses tells the people, Fear not, stand still, see the salvation of the Lord, which He will show to you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, you shall see them again no more forever. He wants to do a complete and final total work. How many of y'all just going to take your hands off of it and trust God? Now, 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 let me qualify that. Obviously, God tells you to do something, you do it. But the problem is, oftentimes, we've got our hands on things and we're trying to make this happen and make this happen because it seems reasonable to us. Without God's direction. Our responsibility is to trust God. Moses said unto the people, Fear you not, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which He shall show you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. God wants to do a final work. Or do you want to just get into place where you're fighting the same old battle, same old battle, same old addictions, until Jesus comes? No, he wants, he wants to bring us to a place. I personally believe in this end times. He wants to bring us to a place where we're not just going through. Same old, same old, same old, same old. Should we not be progressing? Should we not have victory over the things we were fighting last week? Or last year, should we not be? in a place where God has given us complete and total victory over some things in our life. That's what He wants. The Lord shall fight for you. And you'll hold your peace. Amen? I'll be honest with you. Some of y'all that weren't in here this morning would probably be glad that you weren't. Because I haven't preached to this church like I did this morning in a long time. Okay? And I'm, I'm not going to try to keep, I'm not going to try to go down a certain vein that I was in this morning unless the anointing comes on me because I'm resting on the anointing tonight. Do you understand? 
But I'm going to tell you something. Lord got, got on us this morning. Daddy-like. Da- I said daddy-like. Why you talk to me like that? You're not my daddy. Amen. The way the word came this morning, it was daddy-like. It was reproof. It was rebuke. It was correction. Hallelujah. So get the tape. If you're brave. Hallelujah. How many want to walk by faith and not by sight? How many of y'all believe God's for you? And not against you? You're doing good, by the way. The Lord shall fight for you. And you'll hold your peace. And the Lord said unto Moses, This is interesting. Wherefore Christ thou unto me? I don't know what his, his petition was. The Bible doesn't say what Moses was crying. It doesn't say what Moses was praying. But God looks at the man of God and rebukes him. And says, why are you crying, Moses? Tell the people to go forward. Maybe tonight some of us need to hear this word. It's time for you to stop crying. And it's time for you to move forward. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Sister G came up and said, thank you for that word. And she still got a, her finger was still hurt. Amen. Oh, come on. We sit around and cry, boo-hoo, boo-hoo. I mean, it's all right every once in a while. I understand that. It's important to do that sometimes if those are holy tears and sanctified tears. But if those are tears of doubt, and I don't know what Moses' tears was about, I don't know what he was crying about, I don't know what his prayer was about, but evidently it was something that God did not like. What is it about us that sometimes we think we're above correction or above rebuke, and we think that everything that we do, this God is pleased with us? What's wrong with me? Why am I hearing in the middle of the night? I'm not well pleased with him. Why aren't you hearing that? Anybody ever heard God come to them and say, I'm not really pleased with you right now. I'm not well pleased with you right now. If God had come to Moses and rebuked Moses for crying... Sometimes he's got to come to you and he's got to tell you, shut the tears up, shut the crying up, let's go forward, let's move in God, get the victory, stop sucking your thumb, so to speak. It's not time to suck your thumb anymore. It's time to get up and move in God. You've been crying long enough. You've been sucking your thumb long enough. It's time to go forward. Somebody say amen. Amen. I mean, well, it's it's unusual, isn't it, for God to say, in a sense, don't pray anymore. He's saying put in action. Put something into action. If, If we're not careful, church, we can pray and we need to pray. But prayer cannot be a substitute for action. Once we pray to God, then we must, when we get direction from God, put that to action. This is going to blow your mind, but sometimes prayer can be unbelief. Because you're not praying in faith. You're just sitting there crying, boo-hooing, you know, feeling sorry for yourself. That's not praying in faith. Sometimes my prayer is not faith. 
nothing but whining and murmuring and manifestation of unbelief in our lives. Why don't we get a hold and say, okay, yes, God, in Jesus' name, I believe you're going to deliver, hallelujah. This is not for my destruction. It's not for my defeat. It's so the devil can be defeated in a final way in my life. And whatever you tell me to do, God, I'm getting up right now, and I'm going forward. What good is it going to do <coughs> for you and I to sit around and cry all day? We don't feel sorry for ourselves. I mean, I'm, I thank God because God respect, honor the man of God, Moses. He didn't tell us what he was praying, what he was crying about. But God rebuked the man. He rebuked him. It's not time for tears. It's time for movement. It's time for action. Prayer is important, but don't let it become a substitute for action. So God says to Moses, Why are you crying? Why cries thou unto me? Speak unto the children of Israel. that they go forward. I mean, that's really interesting to me. Not that I even come close to Moses, but I do pastor a church. So maybe if I go to God, Oh God, the people. Oh God, the people. Oh God, the people. You know? God, do something. Help me with these people. God might look at me and says, Would you just shut up? All right now. Jesus. All right. Yeah. Tell the people, give them direction, tell them to move, tell them to go forward. Hallelujah. She looks like God. I'm going to put it all on God. You do it, God. God says, No, I'm putting it on you. You tell them to move forward and stop crying. Somebody say amen. amen. Well, you're quiet. Speak unto the children of Israel that they go forward. It's time for us to go forward. I said, it's time for us to go forward. And this, this is for me. It's for you. It's for new converts. It's for old converts. Doesn't matter how long you've been in the church. It's time for you to go forward. Listen to me. I'm trying to help you. When we were on Brazos, I told a man who had been in the church longer than I had been in the church. He started attending our church from another church, from another town. And I pled with that man. I said, man, you've got so much baggage you're carrying around with you. I said, you're never going to be victorious if you don't get rid of the baggage. You don't get rid of the past. He didn't listen. He didn't make it very long. He backslid, went straight off into the world because he wouldn't go forward. He wanted to just carry his baggage around with him all the time. Carry his past around with him all the time. It's time for us to get rid of the baggage. It's to get rid of the past. If you gotta pay your debt, pay your debt. But don't live in it. Go forward. Some of you are carrying too much baggage. Drop it and go forward. Is it not under the blood? Are you not redeemed by the blood of the Lamb? Did He not bring you out by a mighty hand out of Egypt? Why are you still carrying that garbage? I know Pharaoh wants to come. I know it wants to come back in your life. But God says move forward. 
Move forward. Look at your wife and tell them I'm moving forward. I'm not telling your wife to tell you that. I'm telling you husbands to tell your wife that. Okay? Because I'm going to tell you why. I don't have a problem with the women in this church. I got some problem with some men. You men need to look at your wife and say, you really, some of you need to apologize to them. And you need to tell them. You need to humble yourself. You need to say, I'm sorry. I haven't been what I'm supposed to be. I haven't been the spiritual leader that I need to be in our house. I apologize, hon. But I'm going forward. I'm leaving my baggage behind. In Jesus' name. And I'm telling you, I'm not telling the women because the women are not the problem tonight. Some of you men. I'm dallying on you tonight. Because I personally believe that a lot of ladies, a lot of women in this church, I mean, they try with everything they got, they're on fire for God, despite you. But what it could be, if you would get rid of your baggage, and you would go for it. You've cried the tears, fine, good. Get over it, let's move. We've got to move. There's a battle. There's an enemy coming to take us down. We can't, come on somebody. We can't sit here and cry about it. We've got to do something different. We've got to do something to move. Now, that wasn't just off. Because I've thought about this. I've thought about it for hours. I don't have problems with the women right now. And all the time we say, I'm going to preach about, you know, to the women. You need to straighten up holiness, you know. You need to stop wearing tight skirts and low cut blouses. And, you know, you need to don't cut your hair and all of that stuff. And here we go with the holiness, right? It's almost like a whipping post. What about the men? You are called to be a spiritual leader in your house. You're supposed to be an example to your wife and to your children about a, a, a man of God that walks by faith. Don't drag them down. Get up. Let's move. Can't you see? Because of where you are, it's destroying your wife. Some of you men are saying, man, what'd you tell pastor? Nobody has told me anything. But in the Holy Ghost, there's some sisters in this church that have been crying out to God. God, help my family. God, do something in my husband. God has heard. I tell you, God has heard their prayer. You can sit there and look all suave and like you got it together. But God knows where you are and you know where you are. It is time to get up. It's time to move. You got people depending on you. Stop crying, Moses. Tell the people of Israel, move forward. Well, Pastor, I'm having financial problems. I haven't gone to the secretary, church secretary, and said, I want to see their uh, tithing record. Because I don't have to. People who honor God and obey God by bringing their tithes and their offerings are people that don't have ongoing, continual financial trouble. Maybe from time to time. You got financial problems. I've got one question for you. What's your history in your giving? I'm just taking all the excuses away. We want to sit around and we want to cry about everything. 
but God has given you a word. He's given you a divine command, a direct command to obey Him. And you've got the Holy Ghost inside of you to lead you. Because you don't want to do it. You keep ending up in defeat and all you want to do is cry about it. God says, no. If you put, put my word into action, if you believe my word, God can turn around that for you. How many I believe the word of the Lord? I'm not your enemy. I'm for you. God's not your enemy. He's for you. Go forward means to go through. You go forward. If you're going to go forward and you're facing facing the Red Sea, the only way you can go forward is if the Red Sea opens up. Okay? So when they look at that situation and God says go forward, that seems like impossible. It is impossible with man. To go forward means to go through the Red Sea. God says to Moses, Lift thou up thy rod and stretch out thine hand over the sea and divide it. He told the man of God to divide it. The Bible says in the next chapter it was the hand of God that did it. But God said, Moses, you stretch your hand out. Lift up the rod and stretch out your hand. What's interesting, a couple more times in this same chapter, the Bible says Moses lifted his hand over the sea. It doesn't say he lifted the rod. He said he lifted his hand. Hand is a symbol of power. And God tells him, you divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. And I, behold, I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians and they shall follow them. I will get me honor upon Pharaoh and upon all his hosts, upon his chariots, upon his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gotten me honor upon Pharaoh, upon his chariots, and upon his horsemen. It's going to glorify God. Why did God send him that direction? So he could defeat the enemy in a final way and ultimately that he might get the glory. And the angel of God which went before the camp of Israel removed and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud went from before their face and stood behind them. So now, God has been leading them by His pillar. All of a sudden that pillar moves its position. Instead of being in front of them now, the pillar of cloud, the pillar of fire by day, night and the cloud by day moves behind them. Okay, like this. Separating them from the Egyptians or from the enemy. Okay? When God moves like that, the Scripture says this, it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of, the, of Israel and it was a cloud and a darkness to them, but it gave light by night to these so that the one came not near the other all the night. So when God moved... It was at night time. He moved that pillar of fire and He went behind them and He separated the camp of Israel from the Egyptians. His face toward Israel was the face of a smile. Light upon their dwellings. But His face towards the Egyptians was a frown. And what made the difference was the Israelites were obeying the word of the Lord. You want to you want to put a smile on the face of God? Start obeying His word. Start taking Him at His word. Start living by His word, and stop living by your human intellect. And you'll get a smile, Hallelujah, from God, and it'll become light in your dwelling. But people who reject the Word of God always bring the frown of God upon His face. It was darkness. Where are you tonight? Are you in the light? Is God's face shining on you happily? Are you sitting in darkness tonight because you've been rejecting the Word of God? 
It was a frown to the Egyptians. But a shining on His people. Watch. Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night and made the sea dry land and the waters were divided. In the 8th verse of the 15th chapter, it says it came from the blast of his nostrils. All night long, the wind of God separated the Red Sea Drying the ground. Preparing for Israel to be able to cross over. To pass over on dry ground. All night long. The wind of God. From His nostrils. God doesn't have nostrils. In the Old Testament, He's a spirit before He became, uh, before he became Jesus in flesh. He didn't have human nostrils. It's just a human term to help you to understand God. So the east wind that began to blow, it was God's wind. That's the point. It was God's wind. It wasn't just a natural wind that came. It was a supernatural wind that God, God began to blow. And as God began to breathe, that wind began to blow. All night the Israelites were in light and all night the Egyptians were in darkness. And The Bible says as Moses stretched out his hand over the sea that the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all night, made the sea dry land and the waters were divided. And the children went into the midst of the sea upon dry ground and the waters were a wall unto them on the right hand and on the left. The Bible says in that same verse 8 in chapter 15, that this wind came from his nostrils were gathered together. The waters were gathered together. The flood stood upright as a heap and the depths were congealed in the heart of the sea. The word congealed means they were frozen. It doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that they were, they literally turned into ice. But when the wind of God began to come from God's presence those walls divided the water divided and heaped up huge walls on either side and when you looked at those walls it looked like those walls were frozen in time not naturally or literally frozen but it appeared that way supernatural move of God The Egyptians pursued the children of Israel by faith. Hebrews chapter 11, I believe it's verse 29. By faith, the children of Israel had to... Once God did the miracle, they had to by faith walk. <clears throat> and it took faith because as you start walking, when you look at these walls of water around you, the possibility of them collapsing in on you, I mean, that could... That could put some fear inside of you. But they walked by faith. They trusted God to hold the waters up so the waters wouldn't come down, come tumbling down upon them, you know? The ground was dry. It wasn't. They didn't get stuck in the muck and the mire. Dried supernaturally. Supernaturally held up by the presence of God. The light of God, the glory cloud behind them and in front of the Egyptians. And if you study it, you'll find that that glory cloud not only was behind them, giving them light to their path, but it was like this over the top of them. So basically, when they were going through, they were in a casket. They were in a coffin. Covered by light. 1 Corinthians 10, please. Covered, entombed in the glory of God. 
with the light of that pillar of fire radiating, reflecting from glory to glory, one side to the other. Light everywhere. Light shining on them. Light bouncing off, being mirrored in those walls and the glory of God overshadowing them on top. They were literally entombed with the light of God himself. And the Egyptians were in darkness. Why would God encase them in a coffin of light? Because it is a type. Read. First Corinthians 10.1 they were where? Under the cloud. And all passed through the sea. All passed through the sea. Read. They were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Okay, stop. They were baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Moses is a deliverer. He is the type of Jesus. And these people were baptized to their deliverer in the cloud and in the sea. Spirit baptism and water baptism. They were buried with Him in baptism. They were encased in a coffin, typically speaking, that brought to them salvation. They've been redeemed by the blood, but progressive revelation shows you they were baptized unto their Redeemer Moses in the cloud. That's the Holy Ghost. And in the sea, that's water baptism in Jesus' name. If you want to know how you are joined to your Redeemer, to your Deliverer, it's by water and it's by spirit. They were literally entombed. As they went forward. Light everywhere. Light shining from the back, shining from the top, shining from each side. Glory to the glory of God was everywhere. And they're being baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Isn't God good? <coughs> and they walk by faith. By faith. And they had light. And then here comes the Egyptians. They decide, we're going to do what the what Israelites are doing. We're going to go in there too. The problem is, is that they're unbelievers. The problem is that the Egyptians are not believers. The problem is the Egyptians are in rebellion against the Word of God. So when they try to travel where the Egyptians are traveling, they are creating great danger for themselves. In the Holy Ghost, to me, what happens if we have to move as a church? What if we get a direct divine commandment from God and we have clear revelation and guidance by the glory cloud, the Spirit of God, that we are supposed to leave? What about all the unbelieving family members that you know? Are they supposed to go? No, the Israelites went over on dry ground. They were delivered, hallelujah, by their Redeemer because they believed in the Word of God. But darkness was upon the unbeliever. And when they tried to cross over the same territory, the Bible says the judgment of God fell on them. I'm telling you, people who walk in unbelief walk where angels fear to tread. A person who is like an Egyptian, a person who does not believe the Word of God and live by the Word of God, when they try to walk where the believer walks, it will bring judgment upon them. Amen, amen. They tread in dangerous places. Amen, amen. Unbelievers tread in dangerous places amen. where angels fear to tread. Honestly, your unbelieving family member wouldn't want to go with us. That's right. Amen, Pastor. That's right. Because what would bring deliverance to you 
would bring the judgment of God Almighty upon them. We talk about those kinds of days where we have to make a, a, a relocation, a geographical relocation. You're talking about days like that. You're talking about the time of the tribulation period. Either that or great persecution. An unbelieving family member doesn't want to go with the church. They are presuming. They are presuming. It will bring the judgment of God Almighty on them. Amen, amen. You understand what I'm saying? Yes, sir. And so here comes Pharaoh. Now, Jewish scholars, or actually not Jewish scholars, but Egyptian history says that this Pharaoh didn't die. That he survived. That he sent all of his armies out front. Can you go ahead and go? We're going to see what happens. I mean, wouldn't you be, wouldn't you be a little bit, now, I don't believe Egyptian history. He, uh, he drowned. Because God said, I'm going to cut him off. God said, I'm going to slay. He already prophesied to Moses that he was going to kill him. Okay? So I'm going to go with the Bible. But let's just give it as a possibility, you know? That at least at the first, he starts thinking about, man, I've just went through nine plagues. from this God and the tenth one took my baby boy and I'm fixing to follow them in where? I mean it'd probably be pretty smart for him to to think about it. Is he going to follow him in there? You ought to apologize for the way you came to the house of God tonight. I shouldn't say I shouldn't talk like that should I? I should? Thanks. Thanks. God bless you. Amen. 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 But look what he did. He, he biblically, he joined all of his armies, the elite forces. He rode right into there. I say stupid. I say stupid, stupid, stupid. I say satanic stupidity. Okay, you don't like me talking like that, but that's basically what it is. If you've just gone through nine plagues plus one, the tenth one, your baby's dead, and you're chasing the people of God, and you see this huge miracle of waves of water walled up by this God, you, you know, I mean, you've got to be completely stupid to follow in, to go in there. But that's what the sinner does. They always do stupid things and go to stupid places and they walk where angels fear to tread and they don't realize how dangerous where they're walking is. And they just go headlong right into hell. Headlong right into the judgments of God. I mean, you know, come on somebody. You're relying on your own human intellect. You do things like that. Yes, sir. But then when the enemy gets a hold of you, it's not just stupid, it's satanic stupid. The judgment of God is fixed to fall on this man. God's going to wipe them all out. Now watch. The Egyptians pursued and went in after them to the, in, into the midst of the sea. Even all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. And it came to pass that in the morning, watch, the Lord looked unto the host of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and the cloud and troubled the host of the Egyptians. First thing they did when they tried to walk where the believer walked and tried to destroy the believer. The first thing is God sent panic. Panic in their midst. They started, you talk about being full of trouble, man. They're looking at each other. Say, the Lord, Israel's God, is coming to fight for them. I mean, they're troubled. They're panic-stricken. 
This is the way of the unbeliever. These, this is the way of people who don't believe the Word of God. Trouble in their life. The Bible says, God troubled them. It doesn't say the devil did. It says the Lord troubled them. The Lord troubles the, the unbeliever every day. He draws them. He wants to save them. But when they reject His Word and say, I'm not going to obey God. Who is the Lord that I should obey Him? God troubles them every day. And then the next thing, the Bible says He took off their chariot wheels. And He's still doing that today, by the way. He's not taking the chariot wheels off of old Pharaoh. They're dead. But He's still today taking wheels off of people. Yes, He does. He still today removes wheels off of people because they're riding in rebellion against Him. You ride in rebellion against God, God says, I'll take your wheels. He still does it today. Now, I don't want to be against God and provide wheels. Because God's in the business of taking wheels off. Amen? How many of you like your wheels? You like your wheels? You got some pretty wheels. You know, there's some people, it don't matter what their car looks like as long as they have pretty wheels. They spend a thousand dollars on their car and five thousand on their wheels. You know? So they walk around and say, you like my wheels? I like your wheels. Those are nice wheels. <laughs> you know? I mean, I was watching a, a commercial not long ago, and this guy was talking about you go and buy a car. He's doing an insurance commercial. He said you go and buy a car, and you have a wreck. And, and you know, you spend, I, thought, I don't remember how much money he said, but just, I'm gonna, just thousands of dollars on your wheels. And you go and wreck, you know, your wheels. Hallelujah. And the insurance pay, uh, won't pay. Right? They, they, they say, well, it's only worth a certain amount because of depreciation. And he talked about how expensive the wheels were and how much the insurance is going to pay because it's a depreciation. The wheels are depreciated. And I'm thinking, I, you know how slow I am. I'm thinking the whole time, man, somebody bought themselves fifteen, twenty thousand dollar wheels. I'm taking him literal. I'm not. Anyway. He's talking about the whole car. I'm thinking about wheels. You know? Some people, they just love their wheels, man. But God is in the business of removing people's wheels who ride in rebellion against Him. How many want your wheels? Look at your neighbor and say, I want my wheels. My wheels mean something to me. You keep riding in rebellion against God Almighty and God can remove your wheels to stop you from rebelling against Him. That's why I say today, He still removes wheels of the rebellious that rebel against Him that don't want to ride with Him. And they're going to stand around, what happened to my wheels? And all their friends say, what happened to your wheels? Well, they're probably not going to give God the glory and say, God took my wheels. <laughs> How many of you want your wheels? And I mean the whole car. <laughs> then ride with God. You might get to keep your wheels. I remember we bought a car from Brother Patrick. 
and didn't didn't keep it long, but we bought it. And Christina looked at that thing and said, I want some new wheels. I said, man, I said, the wheels that are on it are stocked. They're just fine. I want me some wheels. I can't tell you how much money I lost on them wheels. <laughs> Amen. There's a something something wrong with the car, and we the people the dealership took it back because there was something wrong with the car, and we asked them the question, "Do you want the wheels?" <laughs> they said, "No, we don't want the wheels. We just want the car. And if you have the stock wheels, bring them." And we had those things in our garage for I don't know how long. Amen. What is it about people in wheels? We're not going to talk about that one. <laughs> those were Jeep wheels that I had. Those are man wheels. Amen. <coughs> God took the wheels off. Y'all want to hear my, about my wheels? Amen. <coughs> you know, isn't it amazing when you buy wheels and you think they're so great and when you get ready to sell them, Nobody wants them. Seriously, nobody wants them. <clears throat> Pretty soon you just got to give them away. Here, just get them out of the garage. I'm tired of looking at them. I'm tired of looking at my mistake. That's where it finally got to, you know. Finally got to the point. I'm just tired of looking at my mistake. My mistake. Just put them in the garage sale. First come, first serve. Give them to them for two dollars. <laughs> Just so I don't have to look at my mistake anymore. You know, so that's sort of my story about my wills. Amen. How much did we finally sell my Jeep wills for? Put three wheels. She don't even know what they are. They're wheels, not tires. Wheels. The tires is the rubber around the thing. Thirty dollars for all of them. That's all. I, that's all we got. Thirty dollars, and they were in the box, and they they cost me more than thirty dollars. Can't buy a wheel for thirty dollars. It's bad. I guess we. How many? Of you, I like wheels. You like wheels? <laughs> And we want to keep your wills. I'm going to keep my wills. As long as they're not a mistake in the garage, you know, keep my wills. Praise the Lord. <coughs> How many of y'all believe that God can take your wills off? He still does it today. He knows how to stop us from riding in rebellion. Hallelujah. Next thing I feel like the Lord was speaking to me about this morning was this, <coughs> was <coughs> that for Israel, when they started going on, on in a dry land, it was a good thing for them. It was by faith and it was their victory and their deliverance coming. But for Pharaoh, it was a bad drying up. It meant the judgment's fixing to come on him. For him, 
And for so many today that are in rebellion against the Word of God, their water is drying up. Their well is drying up right now. And it should be telling them the judgment's fixing to fall on me. You know, why are my wheels getting popped off here? Why is this place drying up here? Because God's getting ready to judge you because you've rejected His Word. Is that a sad thing? How many, people, how many people's wells are drying up right now? Amen, Their water's drying up right now. Preparing for a judgment that's coming. You know, you think about what God did here, this miracle. Mexico, October the 23rd, a couple of days ago, I believe it's the 23rd, today's the 25th. In Mexico, the strongest hurricane ever recorded in the Western Hemisphere the strongest ever recorded hit Mexico. That ought to tell you something. We're in the last days. God is in control of the wind. He's in control of the storms. Could it create in a short period of time a Category 5? The strongest recorded hurricane to ever hit. Ever recorded her uh, strongest recorded of all time to ever hit the Western Hemisphere. And it's easy for God to do. For us, we're in the light. And we're rejoicing. And we're thanking God because we're saved. But that's a signal to the unbeliever to wake up. It's a signal the judgments of God are falling. Do you understand? They started getting full of trouble. Verse 24, He took off their chariot wheels. And the Bible says, So the Egyptians said, Let us flee from the face of Israel, for the Lord fighteth for them against the Egyptians. God's fighting. For them against the Egyptians. And the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch out thine hand over the sea, that the waters may come again upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots, and upon their horsemen. Moses stretched forth his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to his strength. When the morning appeared, and the Egyptians fled against it, and the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. And the waters returned, and covered the chariots and the horsemen, and all the host of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them. There remained not so much as one of them. Israel made it through, Waters of judgment came. Man, those waters started falling in on the Egyptians and dead bodies. <laughs> Everywhere. I'm not talking about a small host. A huge host, just dead bodies. <laughs> Water throwing them up. Putting them on the shore. As a testimony that they were dead. They weren't just drowned, never to be seen again. They were drowned and placed on the shore. Many of them. So that the people of God could say, those people died. They experienced God's judgment because they rejected the Word of the Lord. What was salvation to the Israelites was judgment upon the unbeliever. And the Bible says in verse 30, Thus the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead upon the seashore. And Israel saw that great work which the Lord did upon the Egyptians. And the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and His servant Moses. When those dead bodies were being slung up on the shore, what God, why did they fear? What, what, what did they think when they saw the judgments of God? And they saw the Egyptians drown. What did the Israelites think? The Bible said they feared the Lord. They believed the Lord. And thirdly, His servant Moses. What did they believe? 
Don't ever doubt the Word of God. Don't ever doubt it. Because God's Word is true. They might not have believed it. They might have took it, took it lightly. Even though they experienced a total of ten plagues. But when that judgment of water came down upon them and dead bodies are laying everywhere, don't ever doubt the Word of God. Judgment is going to come upon the unbeliever. And the Bible said they feared the Lord, they believed the Lord, and the servant of the Lord Moses. As I come, chapter 15. For Israel, it's a great time of celebration, a great time of victory. The Bible says, Then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord. It's time to celebrate. It's time to praise God. It's time to give God the glory for what He's done. Moses started singing under inspiration of the Holy Ghost, under the inspiration of God, he started singing this song. And this song was a prophecy. He started singing prophetic words. He sang, the Bible says, I can't sing, but I can preach the Word of God. So in a sense, it's like Moses is preaching, Moses is singing prophetically. It's like when a preacher preaches the Word of God, in a sense, he's singing. It's a prophetic thing that's going forth. And what happened? The children of Israel started joining in with the song. And they started singing. And the Bible says, in this first recorded song in the Bible, then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto who? The Lord. Saying, I will sing unto the Lord, for He hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath He thrown into the sea. And at the same time that Moses was singing, and at the same time the children were singing with him, the Bible says Miriam the prophetess gets a tambourine in her hands. She goes outside of the camp and she gets all the women She says, come with me, sisters. Come with me, ladies. And the Bible says they started singing. And notice what they sang. Miriam, the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took a timbrel in her hand, and all the women went out after her with timbrels and with dance. And Miriam answered them, See ye to the Lord, for He hath triumphed gloriously. It's the same thing that Moses was singing. It was the same thing the children of Israel were singing. The Lord had triumphed gloriously. And Miriam the prophetess with the women of Israel sang back. They started singing to each other. Moses is singing. The children of Israel are singing. And the women of God and the prophetess are singing. So they're singing to the Lord, but they're singing to each other back and forth. Face to face. Not like when we come to church and we look at the back of somebody's head and we sing the songs. No, they faced off with each other. And Moses sang. And the men, the children of Israel sang. And the women under prophetic leadership from the prophetess Miriam, they started singing back and forth. Why? So there would be glory. And they started singing about the glory of the Lord. Moses said it first. Hallelujah, the Lord. He had triumphed gloriously. And the prophetess and the women said, The Lord, He had triumphed gloriously. And back and forth it went, singing to each other. Hallelujah to the Lamb. That's the way church is supposed to be. It's not supposed to be somebody entertaining you. When they sing, you're supposed to sing. They sing, you sing back to them. You give God the glory. Hallelujah. You say the same thing. It's a mirror. It's a reflection of praise that should be going on. I shouldn't be just looking in the back of somebody's head. I should be looking at them face to face. Hallelujah. 
because the glory of God dwells between the faces. His glory dwells between the cherubim or between the faces. And so when you and I look at each other, not at the back of each other's head, but we look at each other and we say, He's glorious. He's glorious. He's glorious. He's glorious. glorious." See, something is going to happen in that kind of atmosphere because I'm looking at you and He's dwelling between the faces. And I'm saying, He's glorious. And it... Woo, Jesus, see, you can feel it. Look at your neighbor and say it. He's glorious. And then say it back to him. <laughs> this is what the seraphim knew. They cry one to another. He's holy. He's holy. He's holy. Hallelujah. They are cre- you are creating glory. When you he, I'm going to say it again. He dwells between the faces. If you want to know where his glory is right now, it's in between us right now. Between our faces. And we say he's glorious. He's glorious. He has triumphed gloriously. You want Pharaoh to be defeated in your life? You want the enemy to be defeated in your life? Get with somebody face to face and start saying he's glorious. And as you create that glory in that praise, get ready. The enemy is being defeated in the atmosphere of glory. He's dwelling right now. Why don't you do this? I didn't know how we were going to do this. The Holy Ghost showed me. This side. Face this other side. (coughs) Y'all face each other. (coughs) Okay? Now, hallelujah. This side right now. I know all of you. Okay. Right here. This section. You face there. There you go. And this section faces this section. Okay? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Okay. Now, about half of you turn around and face this group here. So they'll have somebody. Okay? Amen. All right. Now, begin to sing one to another. The Lord had triumphed gloriously. <coughs> Keep on praising it. Keep on singing it. <coughs> See, when you do that, the enemy is defeated. It wasn't just Moses lifting his hand over the sea. It was God triumphing gloriously. He dwells between the faces. Come on, give him some more glory. Back and forth, back and forth. Okay, now listen, listen. I'm going to read you some scripture. We'll do this again in a moment. Psalm 29 says, Give unto the Lord, O ye mighty. Give unto the Lord glory and strength. He is glorious. But glory is something you give Him. Give Him glory. The Bible says that you can give Him strength. I thought He already has all strength and all power. He does. What He's saying is when you praise Him, when you give Him glory, that's when He manifests His power. When you praise Him and He dwells between the faces, you start glorifying Him. That's when He manifests more glory because He is glorious. Look at, look, get in position again and, and begin to sing one to another. He's glorious. The Lord hath triumphed glorious.
Okay, let me read some more. Let me read some more. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto His name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. The God of glory thundereth. The Lord is upon many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaketh the cedars. Yea, the Lord breaketh the cedars of Lebanon. He maketh them also to skip like a calf. Lebanon and, and Syrian like a young unicorn. The voice of the Lord divideth the flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shaketh the wilderness. The Lord shaketh the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord maketh the hinds to cat and discovereth the forest. And in His temple doth everyone speak of His glory. The Lord sitteth upon the flood. Yea, the Lord sitteth king forever. The Lord will give strength unto His people. The Lord will bless His people with peace. That's what He does in the atmosphere of glory. He manifests power. He manifests strength. He manifests victory over the enemy. You'll hear His voice. Now while you're standing there, just stand there for just a moment. Let me tell you this story, okay? Because it will bless you. In around 320 A.D., there was a man by the name of Constantine. He got together with the eastern uh, leader of the eastern empire. Constantine and the eastern leader of the empire agreed together to allow the people to worship one God because the Christians wanted to worship one God. And they said, okay, we will allow it. And so agreement was made between Constantine and the eastern emperor. But the eastern emperor changed his mind. And he sent out a letter to a group of soldiers. And he said this. He said, in, in order to honor Caesar, you must offer a sacrifice to a false god. The captain of that host, the captain of that army, looked at his men and said, you can't worship one god anymore. You've got to offer a sacrifice to a false god in honor of Caesar. Forty men stood up, soldiers of Rome, and they said, we cannot do that. We will not deny Him. We're Christians. And so the captain of that host took them. This is a true story. They took, he took those forty soldiers and he cast them in prison. And all night long, those soldiers sang one to another. They kept worshiping that one true God and they sang in the prison. Are y'all with me here? If you are, give God praise. In a particular sunset, very cold, they told that they, this, this guard of the prison was told to take those 40 men strip their clothes off of their body and send them out onto a frozen lake. This all started at sunset. They put a hot house, a, a hot bathhouse, on the edge of that frozen lake. Pitched it up right there and told those 40 Christian soldiers that while you're out there in the cold, at any time, you can recant your faith in Jesus Christ. You can leave that cold, frozen lake and you can walk into that bathhouse and be warm. Those 40 soldiers, they stripped them down naked. They walked out on that frozen lake and they were heard singing throughout the night the praises of Him. One to another, they sang praises to the glory of God. And as the night went and the colder it got, their voices became softer and softer so that you couldn't hear them singing anymore. And the guard, he knew they were dead. He started making his way out there 
to look the situation over. And he looked up and he saw a man coming from the frozen lake. That man made his way to that hot bathhouse to get warmth. 39 of the 40 soldiers froze to death on that frozen lake giving God glory. When that guard saw that 40th one go into that bathhouse, he stripped his clothes off of his body. And he walked out there and there were 39 bodies of soldiers all piled up upon each other who had died for their faith. And he made this statement, true story, you don't have 39 now, you have 40. Their song, their praise in the night captured that prison guard. And that prison guard started singing the same songs as the believers. And he died with them. They had a chance to turn their back. But they said, no, we're going to give him glory. Look at each other one more time. And give him glory one more time. He's worthy of praise. Say this one to another. The Lord had triumphed gloriously. Okay, hold on, hold on. I'm going to tell you, I feel the Holy Ghost right now. Okay, but I, I got I, I to give you some more. Okay, I got to give you some more fuel. I got to give you some more word. Okay, you with me here tonight? The Lord had triumphed gloriously. Miriam the prophetess, leading the women, sang it back. The Lord had triumphed gloriously. The same thing. They were creating glory and atmosphere of praise. The Bible says they started giving in their song, it was about faith. They started singing words of faith. The Bible says they were singing it to the Lord. The Lord, for He had triumphed gloriously. The horse and rider hath He thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and song. He has become my Yeshua or my salvation. He is my God. I will prepare Him a habitation. My Father's God. I will exalt Him. Do you see what they're doing? They're singing and their song is about faith. They're singing to God and talking about he is strength. He is salvation. He is sovereign. He had triumphed glorious. You will get it right now. He's judged the enemy. So their song, first of all, started out with a profession of faith as to who God is. Help me out. Help me. Look at your neighbor and tell him, The Lord is my strength. The Lord is my song. The Lord is my salvation. The Lord is my God. I will prepare Him a habitation. He inhabits the praises of His people. I'm preparing a habitation for Him right now. Amen. Say it again. He's my strength. He's my song. He's my salvation. He's my God. And then they go from there and they start celebrating He's a God of judgment. A lot of people don't want to hear about judgment right now. They only want to hear about the love of God. Understand this. The love of God has no value to it. 
if he does not judge evil. But because God judges sin and God judges evil, his love is valuable. In order for my love to be valuable and for your love to be valuable or worth anything, you have to be willing to judge evil in your life. Because if you're not willing to judge the evil that's in your life, your love is not true love. But because God's love is real and there's value to his love because he judges evil, they start rejoicing in the judgment of God upon sin. Give the Lord praise in the house. Look at you, help me. One to another, the Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his host hath he cast into the sea. Say it with me. Pharaoh's chariots and his host hath he cast into the sea. His chosen captains also are drowned in the Red Sea. The depths have covered them. They sank into the bottom as a stone. Thy right hand, O Lord, is become glorious in power. The right hand in the Bible speaks of His power, His strength, and salvation. Say it with me again. The right hand, O Lord, is become glorious in power. Thy right hand, O Lord, hath dashed in pieces the enemy. Come on, sing it one to another. And the greatness of thy excellency. Thou hast overthrown them. That rose up against thee. Thou sentest forth thy wrath. Which consumed them as stubble. And with the blast of thy nostrils. The waters were gathered together. The flood stood upright as a heap. And the depths were congealed in the heart of the sea. The enemy said, I will pursue. I will overtake. I will divide the spoil. My lust shall be satisfied upon them. I will draw my sword. My hand shall destroy them. Thou didst blow with thy wind the sea. The sea covered them. They sank as lead in the mighty waters. Who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like thee, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? Come on, don't get tired. Keep going. Thou stretchest out thy right hand. The earth swallowed them. Thou in thy mercy hast led forth thy people which thou hast redeemed. Thou hast guided them in thy strength unto thy holy habitation. The people shall hear and be afraid. Sorrow shall take hold on the inhabitants of Palestinia. The dukes of Edom shall be amazed. The mighty men of Moab trembling shall take hold upon them. All the inhabitants of Canaan shall melt away. Fear and dread shall fall upon them by the greatness of thine arm. They shall be as still as a stone till thy people pass over, O Lord. Till the people pass over which thou hast purchased. Thou shalt bring them in and plant them in the mountains of thine inheritance in the place O Lord which thou hast made for thee to dwell in the sanctuary O Lord which thy hands have established the Lord shall reign forever and ever for the horse of Pharaoh went in with his chariots and with his horsemen into the sea and the Lord brought again the waters of the sea upon them but the children of Israel went on dry land in the midst of the sea, giving praise and glory.
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. They celebrated in the first recorded song in the Bible. They made a profession of faith. They celebrated the judgment of God upon the enemy. They sang praises concerning the attributes of God. They declared that God was God. They gave Him glorious worship. Singing one to another. Miriam with a timbrel in hand. And the women of Israel dancing. Singing back the same song. It was a prophecy about what would happen in the last days. The Bible says in Revelation 12 when the enemy chased them into the wilderness in the future. And the enemy spit out a flood of water to destroy them. God opened up the earth and swallowed the water and gave victory to his people once again. In the 15th chapter of the book of Revelation, the Bible says, I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels, having the seven last plagues, for in them it is filled up the wrath of God. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire. And them that had gotten the victory over the beast, over his image, over his mark and over the number of his name stand on the sea of glass having the harps of God and they sang the song of Moses the servant of God and the song of the Lamb saying great and marvelous are thy works Lord God Almighty just and true are thy ways thou King of saints who shall not fear thee O Lord, and glorify thy name. For thou only art holy. For all nations uh, shall come and worship before thee. For thy judgments are made manifest. Uh, give God praise in the house. Uh, we're singing the song of Moses tonight. And the song of the Lamb. Victorious. We're standing on the sea of glass. Mingled with fire. Victorious in Jesus name. Amen. One more time, look at each other and say to each other, the Lord had triumphed gloriously. God has given us the victory. I'm not leaning on my own understanding. I gave that up. I gave up leaning on my own understanding. Just, just a sec. Hold on. Hold on. Let me give you opportunity to praise once again, one to another, but I want you to, to, uh, to realize, I want you to understand who it is that's in the midst of you tonight. The glorious Lord has triumphed glorious. When you say that to each other, say it to the Lord. When you say that to each other, recognize in a holy reverence that He's here right now in between your face. The God of glory is here right now. Lord, I thank You tonight. As Your Word has gone forth, and Your people are responding to it. You're dwelling in the midst of their faces. 
light to your people. Not darkness, but light. The glory of the Lord is risen upon you. You say, but pastor, I'm not worthy. He redeemed you by His blood. Pastor, I'm not worthy. I failed. I've leaned upon my own understanding. Tonight, repent of that. Declare, declare as Moses declared. Declare as the children of Israel declared. Declare as the prophetess Miriam declared with the women in the house. Declare the greatness of your God. Declare that He is your God. Make a declaration, a prophetic declaration right now that you're going to follow Him. Hallelujah, that He is your God. You will praise Him in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, let the wind blow on your people. The wind of your spirit blow. In Jesus' name. Do you love him? If you love him, tell him. If you love him, tell him. Okay, I, I, I'm going to be honest with you. I, got to, I need to get out of the way here. I need to get out of the way here. Okay? So do whatever the Lord says to you to do. Do it. Do what he tells you to do. All right? I'm not going to hinder anything. Whatever the Lord says to you, do it. Do it. I know that God can meet every need. There you go. There you go. Amen. Praise God. Worthy God are you to be praised. Hallelujah, hallelujah. 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 Hall